We're going to learn. We're going to see how many times Ada can forgive her friend Jax. Jax is super hungry and accidentally eats a lot of Ada's things, and she keeps forgiving him. So we're going to see how many times Ada can forgive Jax. And we're also going to learn that even though we forgive someone infinity times, that it's also not okay for that person to continue hurting us. Last week in our gospel, we talked about what do we do if we have a disagreement with someone in the church. Well, the gospel told us we'll go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, right? Don't triangulate. Don't go to someone else and complain about this person. Go to that person directly and talk to them about it. If that doesn't work, try and bring one or two people along to mediate. And if that doesn't work, then you bring it to the community. And then if that doesn't work, you might have to ask that person to leave the community. So it's a delicate balance. That is directly before our gospel today in the book of Matthew. It's a delicate balance between forgiving someone and holding that person accountable to their baptized call. And that baptized call, little Finn, is to love God, to love creation, and to love yourself. And so how do you respond to God's endless reservoir of forgiveness and grace? How do you respond to others with that same boundless forgiveness and grace, and yet also let that person know that hurting you is not okay? It can be a hard thing, especially the part where you hold them accountable. How do you, in a loving way, tell them that what they are doing is hurtful to you? And then on the flip side of that, if we are bound in this Christian baptized call together in this ministry together, this ministry of forgiveness and holding each other accountable, are we ready to hear that word of accountability? When we, as inevitably broken human beings, fall short of that goal of loving God, neighbor, and ourselves. When we fall short, are we ready to hear that word of accountability? How are we going to respond in a grace-filled, loving way? You see, the great thing about God's boundless forgiveness and grace is that we don't need to worry about earning our own worth. We don't need to worry about defining what makes us good because God has already decided that you are worth loving. God has already decided that you are good enough for God. And so when we hear a hard word from our sisters and brothers about how we are sometimes hurtful, we have an opportunity not to defend our worth because we don't need to do that, but to learn and grow in the Christian faith. It's a delicate balance between forgiveness and accountability. I hear in Peter's question to Jesus a compassionate yearning for uh, forgiveness, a compassionate yearning for wholeness and community. Jesus had just said, you know, if all of these ways don't work, if the one-on-one -on -one doesn't work, if the mediator doesn't work, if the church doesn't work, maybe it's time for that person to leave. And in response, Peter says, you know what? I think I could forgive someone seven times. If it means holding that community together, I think I could forgive that person seven times. And Jesus responds, how about 77 times? How about more times than you can count? It's a delicate balance between holding a community together and holding a community accountable to its call to love each other, to love God, and to love themselves. What I love about this parable is I think it's easiest in this parable, maybe more than any other, to forego putting ourselves in the character's shoes. This is an opportunity to not ask, who am I? Am I the ungrateful servant? Am I the king? Am I the servant who's denied forgiveness? This is our opportunity to see a parable as a parable. This is a story that helps us learn something about God Christ uses the words kingdom of God. This is our opportunity to learn something about forgiveness. Sometimes when we put ourselves into the characters, we can get so distracted with justice for that character or so distracted with the challenge for that character that we forget to learn something about the story itself. And what does our story tell us today? That forgiveness bears real consequences for the lives of the people involved. It bears real consequences for the ungrateful slave. 
quote unquote. It bears uh, response, or consequences for the slave who is not forgiven his debt. It bears real consequences for the king even, and even the people who are watching this from the sideline. Sometimes when we approach a situation, it can be easy to dehumanize the situation and call it an issue. It can be easy to distance ourselves from the caring for the neighbor part and think of it as a problem rather than a human being in need, whether that's this human being, yourself, or it's someone else. What Christ is asking us to do is to feel the transforming power of that grace and forgiveness that's so freely given by God. To feel that, to be transformed by it, and to share that with the people around us. God is calling us to see each other as children of God. Maybe one of my proudest moments working at camp was coming up with the word cog, child of God. Or cogs, children of God. We are children of God. And when Christ came, he joined created nature with divine nature and changed what it means to be a created being. Christ changed what it means. And now we have been pulled into community. We're not individual silos that are trying to operate and defend our worth and trying to earn our way in this world, earn our way into God's good graces. God has already made that decision for you. God has already paid the price. God has already earned your forgiveness and your salvation and your worth. And so how do we respond? This is our opportunity to forgive as we have been forgiven. In a little bit, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer as we come to the table. Just before we come to the table, we will speak together the Lord's Prayer, and we will ask to be forgiven our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What this story, what this parable shows us is that when we have a choice to forgive or not forgive, and sometimes it doesn't feel like a choice. Sometimes we're so angry or so hurt or so sad that forgiveness seems impossible. And yet I think of Christ. I think of how sad, how hurt, how frustrated and angry Christ was that he ended up on the cross, that that was his reward for his selfless ministry. And yet still from that cross, he asks God to forgive those who are putting in the nail. There is a way to forgive. And that way is to first feel that forgiveness from God. Until we can feel that forgiveness, until we can feel that transformative grace, it is impossible to forgive seven times or 77 times, sometimes even one time. And yet we pray nonetheless. We pray that God forgives our sins as we forgive those who sin against us because we are broken mortal beings and we do fall short. But God tells us that even though that you fall short, even though you sometimes cannot live up to that call to love God, your neighbor, and those around you and yourself, even though it is impossible as a mortal being to live up to that call, God loves you. And that is your permission to keep trying. That is your permission to keep forgiving. That is your permission to keep holding those around you accountable to the love of God. And so as we go and we continue in this service, as we hear in the Lord's Prayer that word of forgiveness, as we come to the table, I pray that you feel that forgiving and grace-filled God. And as we leave these doors, that is our opportunity, our permission to keep trying. Amen.